Welcome to the encrypted classic horror Valentine's Night Special. And to show you how much I love you, I have five digital download codes for Stephen King and Richard Chismers' Gwendy's Button Box Trilogy to give away. Visit stephenkingaudio.com to learn more about Stephen King and Richard Chismers' electrifying new audiobook, Wendy's Final Task. Return to Castle Rock in this final installment of the New York Times best-selling Gwendy's Button Box Trilogy. Download Gwendy's Final Task wherever audiobooks are sold, or visit stephenkingaudio.com to learn more. And now for your chance to win one of five download codes for the complete trilogy audiobook. Just email me the name of a horror story you love. It couldn't be easier. Send your entry to encryptedpod at gmail.com using the subject line, I love horror. All entries must be received by midnight British time on February the 24th, 2022. The winners will be chosen at random and notified. For competition details, check the description. And now, on with the show. The Open Window by Saki My aunt will be down presently, said a very self-possessed young lady of fifteen. In the meantime, you must try and put up with me. Frampton Nuttle endeavoured to say the correct something which should duly flatter the niece of the moment, without unduly discounting the aunt that was to come. Privately, he doubted more than ever whether these formal visits on a succession of total strangers would do much towards helping the nerve cure which he was supposed to be undergoing. I know how it will be, his sister had said when he was preparing to migrate to this rural retreat. You will bury yourself down there and not speak to a living soul, and your nerves will be worse than ever from moping. I shall just give you letters of introduction to all the people I know there. Some of them, as far as I can remember, were quite nice. Frampton wondered whether Mrs. Sappleton, the lady to whom he was presenting one of the letters of introduction, came into the nice division. Do you know many of the people round here? asked the niece, when she judged that they had had sufficient silent communion. Hardly a soul, said Frampton. My sister was staying here at the rectory, you know, some four years ago, and she gave me letters of introduction to some of the people here. He made the last statement in a tone of distinct regret. Then you know practically nothing about my aunt, pursued the self-possessed young lady. Only her name and address, admitted the caller. He was wondering whether Mrs. Sappleton was in the married or widowed state. An undefinable something about the room seemed to suggest masculine habitation. Her great tragedy happened just three years ago, said the child. That would be since your sister's time. Her tragedy? asked Frampton. Somehow in this restful country spot, tragedies seemed out of place. You may wonder why we keep that window wide open on an October afternoon, said the niece, indicating a large French window that opened onto a lawn. Oh, it is quite warm for the time of the year said Frampton. But has that window got anything to do with the tragedy? Out through that window, three years ago to a day, her husband and her two young brothers went off for their day's shooting. They never came back. In crossing the moor to their favourite snipe shooting ground, they were all three engulfed in a treacherous piece of bog. It had been that dreadful wet summer, you know, and places that were safe in other years gave way suddenly without warning. Their bodies were never recovered. That was the dreadful part of it. Here the child's voice lost its self-possessed note and became falteringly human. Poor aunt always thinks that they will come back some day. They and the little brown spaniel that was lost with them and walk in at that window just as they used to do. That is why the window is kept open every evening till it is quite dusk. Poor dear aunt. She has often told me how they went out. Her husband, with his white waterproof coat over his arm, and Ronnie, her youngest brother, singing, Bertie, why do you bound? As he always did to tease her, because she said it got on her nerves. Do you know, 
Sometimes, on still, quiet evenings like this, I almost get a creepy feeling that they will all walk in through that window. She broke off with a little shudder, and it was a relief to Frampton when the aunt bustled into the room with a whirl of apologies for being late in making her appearance. I hope Vera has been amusing you, she said. She has been very interesting, said Frampton. I hope you don't mind the open window, said Mrs. Sappleton briskly. My husband and brothers will be home directly from shooting, and they always come in this way. They've been out for snipe in the marshes today, so they'll make a fine mess over my poor carpets. So like you menfolk, isn't it? She rattled on cheerfully about the shooting and the scarcity of birds, and the prospects for duck in the winter. To Frampton it was all purely horrible. He made a desperate but only partially successful effort to turn the talk on to a less ghastly topic. He was conscious that his hostess was giving him only a fragment of her attention, and her eyes were constantly straying past him to the open window and the lawn beyond. It was certainly an unfortunate coincidence that he should have paid his visit on this tragic anniversary. The doctors agree in ordering me complete rest, an absence of mental excitement, and the avoidance of anything in the nature of violent physical exercise, announced Frampton, who laboured under the tolerably widespread delusion that total strangers and chance acquaintances are hungry for the least detail of one's ailments and infirmities, their cause and cure. On the matter of diet, they are not so much in agreement, he continued. No, said Mrs. Sappleton, in a voice which only replaced a yawn at the last moment. Then she suddenly brightened into alert attention, but not to what Frampton was saying. Oh, here they are at last, she cried, just in time for tea, and don't they look as if they were muddy up to their eyes? Frampton shivered slightly and turned towards the niece with a look intended to convey sympathetic comprehension. The child was staring out through the open window with dazed horror in her eyes. In a chill shock of nameless fear, Frampton swung round in his seat and looked in the same direction. In the deepening twilight, three figures were walking across the lawn towards the window. They all carried guns under their arms and one of them was additionally burdened with a white coat hung over his shoulders. A tired brown spaniel kept close at their heels. Noiselessly, they neared the house, and then a hoarse young voice chanted out of the dusk, I said, Bertie boy, why do you bow? Franton grabbed wildly at his stick and hat. The hall door, the gravel drive, and the front gate were dimly noted stages in his headlong retreat. A cyclist coming along the road had to run into the hedge to avoid an imminent collision. "'Here we are, my dear,' said the bearer of the white Macintosh, coming in through the window. "'Fairly muddy, but most of it's dry. Who was that who bolted out as we came up?' "'A most extraordinary man, a Mr. Nuttle,' said Mrs. Sappleton could only talk about his illnesses, and dashed off without a word of goodbye or apology when you arrived. One would think he had seen a ghost. I expect it was the Spaniel, said the niece calmly. He told me he had a horror of dogs. He was once hunted into a cemetery somewhere on the banks of the Ganges by a pack of pariah dogs, and had to spend the night in a newly dug grave with the creatures snarling and grinning and foaming just above him enough to make anyone lose their nerve. Romance, at short notice, was her speciality. John Charrington's Wedding by E. Nesbitt No one ever thought that May Forster would marry John Charrington, but he thought differently and things which John Charrington intended had a queer way of coming to pass. He asked her to marry him before he went up to Oxford. She laughed and refused him. He asked her again next time he came home. Again she laughed 
tossed her dainty blonde head and again refused. A third time he asked her. She said it was becoming a confirmed bad habit, and laughed at him more than ever. John was not the only man who wanted to marry her. She was the belle of our village coterie, and we were all in love with her, more or less. It was a sort of fashion, like heliotrope ties or Inverness capes. Therefore, we were as much annoyed as surprised when John Charrington walked into our little local club. We held it in a loft over the saddlers, I remember, and invited us all to his wedding. Your wedding? You don't mean it. Who's the happy pair? When's it to be? John Charrington filled his pipe and lighted it before he replied. Then he said, I'm sorry to deprive you fellows of your only joke, but Miss Forster and I are to be married in September. You don't mean it. He's got the mitten again and it's turned his head. No, I said, rising. I see it's true. Lend me a pistol, someone, or a first-class fare to the other end of nowhere. Charrington has bewitched the only pretty girl in our twenty-mile radius. Was it mesmerism or a love potion, Jack? Neither, sir, but a gift you'll never have. Perseverance, and the best luck a man ever had in this world. There was something in his voice that silenced me, and all chaff of the other fellows failed to draw him further. The queer thing about it was that when we congratulated Miss Forster, she blushed and smiled and dimpled, for all the world as though she were in love with him, had been in love with him all the time. Upon my word, I think she had. Women are strange creatures. Well, we were all asked to the wedding. In Brixham, everyone who was anybody knew everybody else who was anyone. My sisters were, I truly believe, more interested in the trousseau than the bride herself, and I was to be best man. The coming marriage was much canvassed at afternoon tea tables and at our little club over the saddlers, and the question was always asked, Does she care for him? I used to ask that question myself in the early days of their engagement, but after a certain evening in August I never asked it again. I was coming home from the club through the churchyard. Our church is on a time-grown hill, and the turf about it is so thick and soft that one's footsteps are noiseless. I made no sound as I vaulted the low lichened wall, and threaded my way between the tombstones. It was at the same instant that I heard John Charrington's voice, and saw her. May was sitting on a low, flat gravestone. Her face turned towards the full splendour of the western sun. Its expression ended at once and forever any question of love for him. It was transfigured to a beauty I should not have believed possible, even to that beautiful little face. John lay at her feet, and it was his voice that broke the stillness of the golden August evening. My dear, my dear, I believe I should come back from the dead if you wanted me. I coughed at once to indicate my presence and passed on into the shadow, fully enlightened. The wedding was to be early in September, two days before I had to run up to town on business. The train was late, of course, for we are on the southeastern, and as I stood grumbling with my watch in my hand, whom should I see but John Charrington and May Forster? They were walking up and down the unfrequented end of the platform, arm in arm, looking into each other's eyes, careless of the sympathetic interest of the porters. Of course, I knew better than to hesitate a moment before burying myself in the booking office, and it was not till the train drew up at the platform that I obtrusively passed the pair with my Gladstone, and took the corner in a first-class smoking carriage. I did this with as good an air of not seeing them as I could assume. I pride myself on my discretion, but if John were travelling alone, I wanted his company. I had it. Hello, old man! came his cheery voice as he swung his bag into my carriage. Here's luck. I was expecting a dull journey. Where are you off to? I asked, discretion still bidding me turn my eyes away, though I saw without looking that hers were red-rimmed. To old Brambridge's, he answered, shutting the door and leaning out for a last word with his sweetheart. Oh, I wish you wouldn't go, John, she was saying in a low, earnest voice. 
I feel certain something will happen. Do you think I should let anything happen to keep me and the day after tomorrow our wedding day? Don't go, she answered, with a pleading intensity which would have sent my Gladstone onto the platform and me after it. But she wasn't speaking to me. John Charrington was made differently. He rarely changed his opinions, never his resolutions. He only stroked the little ungloved hands that lay on the carriage door. I must, May. The old boy's been awfully good to me, and now he's dying, I must go and see him. But I shall come home in time for... The rest of the parting was lost in a whisper, and in the rattling lurch of the starting train. You're sure to come, she spoke as the train moved. Nothing shall keep me, he answered, and we steamed out. After he had seen the last of the little figure on the platform, he leaned back in his corner and kept silence for a minute. When he spoke, it was to explain to me that his godfather, whose heir he was, lay dying at Pease Marsh Place, some fifty miles away, and had sent for John, and John had felt bound to go. I shall be surely back tomorrow, he said, or if not the day after, in heaps of time, Thank heaven one hasn't to get up in the middle of the night to get married nowadays. And suppose Mr. Brambridge dies? Alive or dead, I mean to be married on Thursday, John answered, lighting a cigar and unfolding the times. At Pease Marsh Station we said goodbye, and he got out, and I saw him ride off. I went on to London, where I stayed the night. When I got home the next afternoon, a very wet one, by the way, my sister greeted me with, Where's Mr. Charrington? Goodness knows, I answered testily. Every man since Cain has resented that kind of question. I thought you might have heard from him, she went on, as you're to give him away tomorrow. Isn't he back? I asked, for I had confidently expected to find him at home. No, Geoffrey, my sister Fanny always had a way of jumping to conclusions especially such conclusions as were least favourable to her fellow creatures. He has not returned, and what is more, you may depend upon it, he won't. You mark my words. There'll be no wedding tomorrow. My sister Fanny has a power of annoying me which no other human being possesses. You mark my words, I retorted with asperity. You had better give up making such a thundering idiot of yourself. There'll be more wedding tomorrow than ever you'll take the first part in. A prophecy which, by the way, came true. But though I could snarl confidently to my sister, I did not feel so comfortable when late that night, I, standing on the doorstep of John's house, heard that he had not returned. I went home gloomily through the rain. Next morning brought a brilliant blue sky, gold sun, and all such softness of air and beauty of cloud as go to make up a perfect day. I woke with a vague feeling of having gone to bed anxious, and of being rather averse to facing that anxiety in the light of full wakefulness. But with my shaving water came a note from John which relieved my mind and sent me up to the Forsters with a light heart. May was in the garden. I saw her blue gown through the hollyhocks as the lodge gate swung to behind me. So I did not go up to the house, but turned aside down the turfed path. He's written to you too, she said, without preliminary greeting, when I reached her side. Yes, I'm to meet him at the station at three, and come straight on to the church. Her face looked pale, but there was a brightness in her eyes, and a tender quiver about the mouth that spoke of renewed happiness. Mr. Brambridge begged him so to stay another night, that he had not the heart to refuse. She went on. He is so kind. But I wish he hadn't stayed. I was at the station at half past two. I felt rather annoyed with John. It seemed a sort of slight to the beautiful girl who loved him, that he should come, as it were, out of breath, and with the dust of travel upon him, to take her hand, which some of us would have given the best years of our lives to take. But when the three o'clock train glided in and glided out again, having brought no passengers to our little station, I was more than annoyed. There was no other train for thirty-five minutes, 
I calculated that with much hurry. We might just get to the church in time for the ceremony. But oh, what a fool to miss that first train. What other man could have done it? That thirty-five minutes seemed a year, as I wandered around the station, reading the advertisements and the timetables, and the company's bylaws, and getting more and more angry with John Charrington. This confidence in his own power of getting everything he wanted the minute he wanted it was leading him too far. I hate waiting. Everyone does, but I believe I hate it more than anyone else. The 3.35 was late, of course. Drive to the church, I said as someone shut the door. Mr. Charrington hasn't come by this train. I ground my pipe between my teeth and stamped with impatience as I watched the signals. Click. The signal went down. Five minutes later, I flung myself into the carriage that I had brought for John. Anxiety now replaced anger. What had become of the man? Could he have been taken suddenly ill? I had never known him have a day's illness in his life. Even so, he might have telegraphed. Some awful accident must have happened to him. The thought that he had played her false never, no, not for a moment, entered my head. Yes, something terrible had happened to him. And on me lay the task of telling his bride. I almost wished the carriage would upset and break my head so that someone else might tell her. Not I, who... But that's nothing to do with this story. It was five minutes to four as we drew up at the churchyard gate. A double row of eager onlookers lined the path from Lichgate to Porch. I sprang from the carriage and passed up between them. Our gardener had a good front place near the door. I stopped. Are they waiting still, Biles? I asked, simply to gain time, for of course I knew they were, by the waiting crowd's attentive attitude. Waiting, sir? No, no, sir. Why, it must be over by now. Over? Then Mr. Charrington's come. To the minute, sir. Must have missed you somehow, and I say, sir, lowering his voice. I never see Mr. John the least bit so afore, but my opinion is he's been drinking pretty free. His clothes were all dusty, and his face like a sheet. Oh, I tell you, I didn't like the looks of him at all, and the folks inside are saying all sorts of things. You'll see something's gone very wrong with Mr. John, and he's dried liquor. He looked like a ghost. And in he went with his eyes straight before him, with never a look or a word for none of us. Him, that was always such a gentleman. I had never heard Biles make so long a speech. The crowd in the churchyard were talking in whispers and getting ready rice and slippers to throw at the bride and bridegroom. The ringers were ready with their hands on the ropes to ring out the very peal as the bride and bridegroom should come out. A murmur from the church announced them. Out they came. Biles was right. John Charrington did not look himself. There was dust on his coat. His hair was disarranged. He seemed to have been in some row, for there was a black mark above his eyebrow. He was deathly pale. But his pallor was not greater than that of the bride, who might have been carved in ivory dress, veil, orange blossoms, face and all. As they passed out, the ringers stopped. There were six of them, and then, on the ears expecting the gay wedding peal, came the slow tolling of the passing bell. A thrill of horror at so foolish a jest from the ringers passed through us all. But the ringers themselves dropped the ropes and fled like rabbits out into the sunlight. The bride shuddered and grey shadows came about her mouth. But the bridegroom led her on down the path where the people stood with the handfuls of rice. But the handfuls were never thrown, and the wedding bells never rang. In vain, the ringers were urged to remedy their mistake. They protested with many whispered expletives that they would see themselves further first. In a hush like the hush in the chamber of death, the bridal pair passed into their carriage, and its door slammed behind them. Then the tongues were loosed, 
a babble of anger, wonder, conjecture from the guests and spectators. If I'd seen his condition, sir, said old Forster to me as we drove off, I would have stretched him on the floor of the church, sir, by heaven I would, before I'd have let him marry my daughter. Then he put his head out of the window. Drive like hell, he cried to the coachman. Don't spare the horses. He was obeyed. We passed the bride's carriage. I forbore to look at it, and old Forster turned his head away and swore. We reached home before it. We stood in the doorway in the blazing afternoon sun, and in about half a minute we heard wheels crunching the gravel. When the carriage stopped in front of the steps, old Forster and I ran down. Great heaven! The carriage is empty! And yet I had the door open in a minute, and this is what I saw. No sign of John Charrington, and of May, his wife, only a huddled heap of white satin, lying half on the floor of the carriage, and half on the seat. I drove straight here, sir, said the coachman, as the bride's father lifted her out, and I'll swear no one got out of the carriage. We carried her into the house in her bridal dress, and drew back her veil. I saw her face. Shall I ever forget it? Why? white and drawn with agony and horror, bearing such a look of terror as I have never seen since, except in dreams. And her hair, her radiant blonde hair, I tell you, was white like snow. As we stood, her father and I, half mad with the horror and mystery of it, a boy came up the avenue, a telegraph boy, they brought the orange envelope to me. I tore it open. Mr. Charrington was thrown from the dog cart on his way to the station at half past one, killed on the spot. And he was married to May Forster in our parish church at half past three, in presence of half the parish. I shall be married, dead or alive. Dead. I mean to be married on Thursday. What had passed in that carriage on the homeward drive, no one knows, no one will ever know. Oh, May, oh, my dear. Before a week was over, they laid her beside her husband in our little churchyard on the time-covered hill, the churchyard where they had kept their love trysts. Thus was accomplished. John Charrington's wedding. A Woman Seldom Found by William Sansom Once a young man was on a visit to Rome. He came from the country, but he was neither on the one hand so young nor on the other so simple as to imagine that a great and beautiful capital should hold out finer promises than anywhere else. He already knew that life was largely illusion, that though wonderful things could happen, nevertheless as many disappointments came in compensation. And he knew too that life could offer a quality even worse, the probability that nothing would happen at all. This was always more possible in a great city intent on its own business. Thinking in this way, he stood on the Spanish steps and surveyed the momentous panorama stretched before him. He listened to the swelling hum of the evening traffic, and watched as the lights went up against Rome's golden dusk. Shining automobiles slunk past the fountains and turned urgently into the bright Via Condotti. Neon red signs stabbed the shadows with invitation. The yellow windows of buses were packed with faces, intent on going somewhere. Everyone in the city seemed intent on the evening's purpose. He alone had nothing to do. He felt himself the only person alone of everyone in the city. But searching for adventure never brought it, rather kept it away. Such a mood promised nothing. So the young man turned back up the steps, past the lovely church, and went on up the cobbled hill towards his hotel. Wine bars and food shops jostled with growing movement in those narrow streets. 
But out on the broad pavements of the Vittorio Veneto, under the trees mounting to the Borghese Gardens, the high world of Rome would be filling the most elegant cafes in Europe to enjoy with aperitifs, the twilight. That would be the loneliest of all, so the young man kept to the quieter, older streets on his solitary errand home. In one such street, a pavementless alley between old yellow houses, a street that in Rome might suddenly blossom into a secret piazza of fountain and baroque church, a grave secluded treasure place. He noticed that he was alone but for the single figure of a woman walking down the hill towards him. As she drew nearer he saw that she was dressed with taste, that in her carriage was a soft Latin fire, that she walked for respect. Her face was veiled, but it was impossible to imagine that she would not be beautiful isolated thus with her, passing so near to her, and she symbolising the adventure of which the evening was so empty, a greater melancholy gripped him. He felt wretched as the gutter, small, sunk, pitiful, so that he rounded his shoulders and lowered his eyes, but not before casting one furtive glance into hers. He was so shocked at what he saw that he paused, he stared, shocked, into her face, he had made no mistake. She was smiling. Also, she too had hesitated. He thought instantly, Haw? But no, it was not that kind of smile. Though as well, it was not without affection. And then amazingly, she spoke. I... I know I shouldn't ask you, but it is such a beautiful evening. Perhaps you are alone, as, as alone as I am. She was very beautiful. He could not speak. But a growing elation gave him the power to smile. So that she continued, still hesitant, in no sense soliciting. I thought perhaps we could take a walk, an aperitif. At last the young man achieved himself. Nothing, nothing would please me more. And the Veneto is only a minute up there. She smiled again. My home is just here. They walked in silence, a few paces down the street, to a turning that young man had already passed. This she indicated. They walked to where the first humble houses ended in a kind of recess. In the recess was set the wall of a garden, and behind it stood a large and elegant mansion. A woman, about whose face shone a curious pale glitter, something fused of the transparent pallor of fine skin, of grey but brilliant eyes, of dark eyebrows and hair of lucent black, inserted her key in the garden gate. And they were greeted by a servant in velvet livery, in a large and exquisite salon, under chandeliers of fine glass, and before a moist green courtyard where water played, they were served with a frothy wine. They talked, Wine, iced in the warm Roman night, filled them with an inner warmth of exhilaration. But from time to time the young man looked at her curiously. With her glances, with many subtle inflections of teeth and eyes, she was inducing an intimacy that suggested much. He felt he must be careful. At length he thought the best thing might be to thank her, somehow thus to root out whatever obligation might be in store. But here she interrupted him, first with a smile, then with a look of some sadness. She begged him to spare himself any perturbation. She knew it was strange, that in such a situation he might suspect some second purpose. But the simple truth remained that she was lonely, and this with a certain deference, something perhaps in him, perhaps in that moment of dusk in the street, had proved to her inescapably attractive, and she had not been able to help herself. The possibility of a perfect encounter, a dream that years of disillusion will never quite kill, decided him. His elation rose beyond control. He believed her, and thereafter the perfections compounded. At her invitation they dined. Servants brought food of great delicacy, shellfish, fat bird flesh, soft fruits, and afterwards they sat on a sofa near the courtyard, where it was cool the cures were brought, the servants retired, a hush fell upon the house, they embraced. A little later, with no word, 
She took his arm and led him from the room. How deep a silence had fallen between them. The young man's heart beat fearfully. It might be heard, he felt, echoing in the hall, whose marble they now crossed, a sense through his arm to hers. But such excitement rose now from certainty. Certainty that at such a moment, on such a charmed evening, nothing could go wrong. There was no need to speak. Together they mounted the great staircase. In her bedroom, to the picture of her framed by the bed curtains and dimly naked in a silken shift. He poured out his love, a love that was to be eternal, to be always perfect, as fabulous as this, their exquisite meeting. Softly she spoke the return of his love. Nothing would ever go amiss, nothing would ever come between them. And very gently she drew back the bedclothes for him. But suddenly, at the moment when at last he lay beside her, when his lips were almost upon hers, he hesitated. Something was wrong. A flaw could be sensed. He listened, felt, and then saw the fault was his. Shaded, soft-shaded lights by the bed, but he had been so careless as to leave on the bright electric chandelier in the centre of the ceiling. He remembered the switch was by the door. For a fraction, then, he hesitated. She raised her eyelids, saw his glance at the chandelier, understood. Her eyes glittered. She murmured, My beloved, don't worry, don't move. And she reached out her hand. Her hand grew larger. Her arm grew longer and longer. It stretched out through the bed curtains across the long carpet, huge, and overshadowing the whole of the long room, until at last its giant fingers were at the door. With a terminal click, she switched out the light. If you enjoy the show and would like to support me, there are several ways you can do so. You can make a one-off donation through Ko-fi. You can join as a YouTube channel member or become a patron on Patreon and make a monthly contribution, gaining access to exclusive content. Liking, commenting, sharing and subscribing all help the channel grow. Thank you for listening and until next time, sweet dreams.